This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Sorry. So I'm going to ask you guys to do a quick favor for me before we begin. How many people use Snapchat? Yeah. So a buddy of mine is like a Snapchat freak, but he's also a great WordPress designer and developer. And I've been trying to get him to speak at a WordCamp or a WordPress meetup or something. So he's a little shy. I think what he doesn't understand is how great the audience is at all of these meetups. So what would be awesome is if I could do a quick little video. And all you guys have to do is wave and say, hey, Jeff. That's it, all right? Everybody down? Yeah? OK. All right, ready? Three, two. Hey, hey Jeff. How was Awesome. <laughs> That's great. And he's getting that right about now. Awesome. All right. So we're going to talk about WordPress security today. Um, how many people are scared of their sites getting hacked? All right. There's way too few numbers. Everybody should be scared. And I actually just, I always kind of worked in the security realm of WordPress a little bit, but I never took a deep interest into it until uh, probably about six months ago. And that's because I've been teaching WordPress for a really long time. And what I realized is that everybody thinks that they're um, not vulnerable. They think that they are free from attack. And I think that's the number one myth. The number two myth is that WordPress is insecure. And that's absolutely true. If you want to be secure, just don't, don't use WordPress. Joking. WordPress is absolutely secure. Uh, WordPress core is absolutely secure. Um, the vulnerabilities are come, come in when you start to add things into it. Um, the second you start to interact with WordPress core is the minute that you start to make it more vulnerable and that usually comes around with your password. Um, that's the number one vulnerability that I've seen. People create the most ridiculous, easy passwords. Um, and I know that I joked about WordPress not being secure. WordPress is secure, so don't worry. Um, if you've seen any of my talks in the past, you know that I like to leave time at the end for questions. Um, I think that's the best way for anybody to learn or digest any information is to be able to talk about it afterwards. And as a professor at now two universities, I realized that everybody's, you know, one in 10 people have a question, nine out of 10 people will benefit from that question. So um, I'm gonna do that. But I think our number one priority tonight is to get out of here by eight so that we can grab a beer at Mead Hall with Kurt because he said that if we get out of here by eight, he could actually have a beer with us. And uh, that's really important. So we should try to do that. My name is Jesse Friedman. I have recently changed positions. I am now at a company called Parka. And uh, Parka, what we've done, we co-founded, I've co-founded this with a few other people. Sam Hotchkiss, I'm sure a lot of you know, he's out of Maine. Uh, we've, we've banded together to create Parka in an effort to create a company that's main focus is on making the internet a better place. But by doing this with massive amount of data, and sharing that between websites. So our number one product right now is Group Protect. Anybody have Group Protect installed on their websites right now? Wow, you guys are all like new customers. It's awesome. <laughs> so Group Protect is uh, a plugin that shares data between the websites with its own network to create a botnet counterforce. And uh, I'll get into it a little bit later. But basically what it does is it protects you from uh, would-be attackers. And what we do now is a, a free service and will always be free. And um, you know, in the future, we're going to get out of security and work on user experience, because that's something that I'm super passionate about. Uh, we'll always do the security thing, but we'll, we'll add on to that. And uh, I'm going to do a quick demo of what we have in store for everybody who is a Brute Protect user. Um, but one of the main challenges for me uh, working on working at Parka was that I had to change my appearance. 
And, uh, but I realized when I joined the team was that literally every single person had a beard. And I've been trying very, 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 very hard to grow a full beard. I have beard envy. Um, and it's not, it's sort of coming in, but not, not like these guys. Um, but we have a great team of developers and designers and project managers all working right now on Fruit Protect. That's our only focus. And the goal is to just make your websites and the internet a safer place. You didn't have a beard. <laughs> yeah, so um, bearded ladies are um, welcome to apply. Because that would really fill out the whole, uh, the whole job genre thing going on. All right, so I'm going to show you the dashboard real quick. So what Root Protect does now is it protects you from botnet attacks, and it's a completely free service. Um, but once we go pro, which is happening in a few weeks, um, those additional services will be something that you can pay for. And um, the things we're going to be offering are uh, WordPress management. So you'll have a dashboard. This is the dashboard. And you'll have all of your sites. So right here you see one site. But you'll have an unlimited number of sites listed there. And that part is free. And it shows you things like how many plugins you have, whether they're up to date, whether the core is up to date, where the themes are up to date. It shows you your uptime. We like this idea of having a certain amount of time without incident, like those old blue, fa uh, blue collar factories. You know, 60 days without incident. Uh, we'll show you how many attacks you've gotten total, how many attacks you've gotten over 30 days, and whether you're blacklisted on any type of um, service. So Google, for example. And that all kind of feeds into what I'm talking about today. Security is not just about preventing someone from hacking your site. Security is about making sure that your website is up, it's available to your users, it's fast, it's searchable, and it's never down. That's what security is really about. Preventing hackers is probably the number one direct threat. But you have to worry about things like giving your FTP credentials to a web developer who doesn't really know WordPress as well as they should. And they could make a mistake. And they could drop a table in your database. That's a security threat. It's not a hacker. It's not what we see as a, um, you know, what we concern ourselves mostly with security. But it is something that we have to be concerned with. So this dashboard, the idea of it is to give everybody the security tools that they need to manage and maintain their WordPress-related website, or the WordPress-powered website in real time. So if your site goes down at 2 o'clock in the morning, you can get an email with a screenshot of your site being down. And they'll tell you how long it's been down, and then we can help you remedy that. Uh, if you need to update core, we all just rose our hand for 3.9, right? But how many people in here manage more than one website? More than five. More than 10, more than 15, more than 20. Okay, so more than 20 sites updating to 3.9 is an all-day affair, in my opinion, if you don't have some kind of WordPress management tool. Here, all you have to do, click one button, update all. And it updates every single one of your websites that you have installed and activated through Group Protect Pro. That's the goal. And it's not about us. Um, competing with other people because there's other management tools out there. Our goal is to really focus on the security aspect and provide you guys with tools that help you to manage your websites and make sure that they're secure. Because one of the most important things you can do to make sure your website's secure is to update core, update your plugins, update your themes. So we'll be talking about that. So if anybody's interested in talking more about this, please come up afterwards and ask questions. If anybody's interested in a free three-month trial, just tweet at Brew Protect and ask for it. You don't have to do anything else. Just say, at Brew Protect, I'd like a free trial, and we'll hit you back and give you a coupon code. All right. So I'm going to jump back in here to the beard slide. Not too many people have a beard slide. Oh, and uh, I've written a couple books. Uh, my latest one is a WordPress security book, which is kind of, I 
advantageous to what we're talking about today. So if anybody wants to read more about everything I talk about today, it's a short read. It's about 50 pages. It's only eight bucks. Uh, you can go to bit.ly slash Jesse Friedman with a capital J and F. All right. So before I get started, I want to give you a little disclaimer. Um, no website on the planet is 100% secure. Certainly not after hearing my talk will your website be 100% secure. And I mean, that's just a typical disclaimer that I like to give because of the fact that um, a lot of it's out of my hands, a lot of it's out of your hands. Some of it has to do with your hosting provider. Some of it has to do with other things that are out of your control. Um, while WordPress core is 100% secure right now and has no flaws, um, you can't say with 100% guarantee that it will ever again be possible. Other things could happen. Um, so just be aware of that, right? Just be aware of your surroundings, be aware of what you're relying on. If your business is relying on WordPress, if your business is relying on any hosting provider, it's your responsibility to do your due diligence to make sure that your website's secure. And um, certainly if you're giving anybody else access, that adds additional vulnerabilities. But what we're going to do is do our best tonight to make sure that you're 99.9999% secure. All right, so types of attacks. This is really important because most people think that they are free and safe. Um, but if we talk about why people want to attack you, maybe you'll understand a little bit more that you're not actually as safe as you can. Has anybody ever gone to a WordPress, not in just a WordPress website, but any website, a blog, seen a Viagra ad? Yeah. Well, I can almost guarantee you that the author or the owner of that account wasn't actually posting Viagra ads. Unless, for some reason, their blog is about Viagra. Um, and then you may not want to want to raise your hand. But the weird thing is, is that these guys, spam links, they can make up to $20,000 a day. It's a ridiculous number. But what they do is if they can hack your website and they can get in and infiltrate your content and inject links to those types of ads, they can make an unbelievable amount of money. If you think about all the WordPress websites out there, how much traffic goes to WordPress websites, or frankly any CMS powered website, and then you, you, you do the math, there's millions and millions and millions of visitors a day who could possibly see those links. And even if 0.001% of people click those links, there's still a lot of money to be made. I think it was like two years ago, um, some numbers came out about spam emails, and it's a billion dollar industry. Even though that probably 99% of the emails that you guys get that are spam end up in your spam inbox, even some of the good emails end up in your spam inbox, there are still a billion dollars worth of revenue of people clicking those spam emails, sending money to Nigeria, whatever it may be, it still happens. So the money is flowing to these hackers and these attackers, and it's it's great reason for them to additionally, you know, to, to hack your site. So that's one reason. Another is link injection. A little less common now, but back in the days when farm linking was uh, a little more popular, when Google didn't uh, blacklist you for this, you could hire uh, a black hat SEO company and uh, you'd say you pay for a thousand links back to your website and they might do a variety of things, but one of the things they might have done was hack somebody's website, inject a link somewhere where you didn't notice it, and link it back to that person who paid for that link. Now that's a lot less common these days, but it still happens. Activism, which is usually something you probably don't have to worry about. Um, but this is basically like someone who thinks that they're doing good work and they might do a DDoS attack to take down your website or they might hack something to release some information. Um, you know, the, uh, what's his name, Snowden and uh, the, you know, the, the government uh, confidential papers get released out into the internet, those types of things. A little less for us to worry about, but it is something that happens. Uh, Drive-by downloads. This is when someone hacks your website, puts malicious code up there, and then all someone has to do to download that code is visit your website. 
And this is what actually feeds into botnet attacks. Uh, so people can actually uh, hack your website, install a virus, people visiting your website gets that virus, and then by getting that virus, they can feed into the botnet machine and keep this going over and over and over again. Uh, redirection is basically stealing your link power, redirecting something else, whatever it may be. The point is, is that um, the, the drive-by downloads or any way that a botnet can get power from your server or your, from your computer is reason enough for them to hack you. So to define a botnet, a botnet is like a network of computer devices, whether it's a server or a fraction of a server or your personal computer. And what happens is, is these computers take the power, the processing power of your computer and steal it from you. And then they use that to hack other websites. And 99% of the time, these attackers don't even know who they're attacking. They write these scripts that say, go out there and find WordPress powered websites or whatever CMS they're looking for. And then they say, attack it. Hit it with brute force, try and get into their email, uh, to, to log in as an admin. And if, once you're in an admin, run these scripts. And if it's a high-powered website, they probably do a direct attack. So if you're like TechCrunch or meetup.com or something like that, um, Forbes got hit by the Syrian Electronic Army in uh, February. Uh, meetup.com got hit by a DDoS attack in March. If you're a big site like that, you're probably going to get a direct hit. They're going to have people with eyes on the, the scripts. They're going to know what they're doing. They're going to be doing a direct attack. But everybody else in this room is vulnerable to a botnet attack because in all actuality, all they do is look out there on the internet. You've been working so hard to get yourself posted on Google, and now they've found you. All they have to do is look for one of the 50 determining factors that says that you're a WordPress-based website. And because of that, they'll start hitting you. And we had plugins in the past. So yeah, so this kind of like leads into this. So no one's website is safe. Because of the fact that nobody, they don't even know who they're attacking. So you have to be aware of this and be able to put up your guards and your shields and, and safeguard yourself. So uh, let me jump back for a second. So botnets are really the number one, probably the biggest thing that you have to worry about. The other things that you have to worry about are more direct attacks. And so if you were, you haven't upset anybody, you haven't written anything on your website that's kind of contradictory or whatever, to, uh, something that's going on, if you haven't, uh, I don't know, I mean, there's a million reasons, but you're less likely to get a direct attack, but it's possible. And the ways that people would get into you through that would be, for example, public Wi-Fi. And even that's anonymous, but did you know that right now, all of you guys on this network that you're on, if you're not um, using SSL or something like uh, cloaking app, uh, app uh, people on this network can actually see your usernames and passwords right now. So if you guys go to your banks right now on this network or any network, that's shared with other people. People can actually monitor that, see what you're sending up and bring it back. And it's not hard at all. I think there's actually a like a Chrome plugin or a Mozilla plugin that will allow you to watch all the traffic going back and forth. Um, so where I live in Rhode Island, in Warwick, I would highly doubt that anybody, I would probably know them personally if someone had the skills to do that. But here in Boston, New York City, other places like that, you have to be extremely aware of this stuff because all it would take is for you to sign into your WordPress website for me to track that password and just add it to my list of sites if I want to do something malicious to FTP. FTP inherently is not secure in any way. And you should never, just don't use FTP. I think, I don't know any hosting provider that doesn't offer secure FTP, and it's basically the same exact process. When you go to FTP, you go to FileZilla or Dreamly or whatever it is that you're using, don't select FTP, just select SFTP. And by creating that secure 
file transfer protocol, you're actually securing your, your uh, connection to the server, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, your hosting environment, something to be wary of, not because they're inherently bad, but because they don't accept or take responsibility, and nor should they, for things like backing up. HostGator's a great company, WP Engine's a great company, and they offer it, like WP Engine offers backups, but um, a lot of hosting companies don't, and it's up to you to, to make sure of that. Um, plugins. So, another common misnomer is that if you go to the WordPress directory plugin, plugin directory, you think that everything on that list has been approved by the WordPress community and is completely 100% safe. The fact of the matter is that there are tens of thousands of plugins with probably thousands of updates a day. So what they do is they look through your code in the first time. They make sure that it's not malicious, they make sure that it's not doing anything out of the ordinary or bad, and once they've discovered, they've realized that, then they give you the free right to make updates. So if I, today, suddenly, I have a plugin up there with 15,000 downloads. I haven't run an update in a while. If I today decided I hated everybody in this room and I wanted to screw everybody in the WordPress community, I could technically write something malicious and update it. It's unlikely. Our community has this down-to-earth, uh, humanistic element where we all feel interconnected and we enjoy each other's company, we come to meetups like this, um, but it is possible for someone to do that. The cool thing about the WordPress community is that that stuff usually comes out very quickly and people are able to comment on it, um, talk about it, and then that plugin would be blacklisted and basically removed. But you have to be aware of the stuff. You have to be ready for it. So make sure that you're reading reviews. Make sure that you're reading comments. If it's not a uh, trusted plugin developer, make sure you do your due diligence. Make sure you do your homework. And the same exact thing goes for themes. And themes, the problem with themes is most plugins are available on the WordPress directory, whereas I think most themes are actually available in a premium theme setting, where you have to pay for it from like WP, uh, or Theme Forest, or you know, ThemeZilla, ThemeFi, Elegant Themes, all these other places. And the same exact thing can happen. And it doesn't have to be malicious, it could be a security hole. So if someone doesn't know enough about security, someone wants to create some very simple little plugin that does some one little widget or something like that, and they don't realize that they didn't you know, close some security hole, or they open some opportunity for someone to do a SQL injection, it's not necessarily that they're being malicious, it's just that they, they're ignorant in a sense. They didn't realize what they were doing creates a security gap. So make sure you're doing your due diligence there. The last thing is, uh, on this slide anyways, is keeping core up to date. Keeping core up to date is absolutely 100% vital. Um, I, I mean, I can't stress this enough. And I know that everybody has this like real moment of hesitation, even now when it's a one-click update, where they're just almost like it's pressing like the nuclear red button, right? Like you just, you don't want to press it. You're almost a little scared. You don't know what's going to happen. I've never, the only time that I've ever had WordPress, and I've been doing WordPress development since I think 2006 or seven, 2006, seven. The only time I've ever had anything screw up on me is when I created a client's theme, and I had it on the server, and I called it the default theme. Remember the default theme before 2010, 2011, 2012? I had it as the default theme, and I did a manual core update, and I threw the default theme up, and it overrode everything. And that was a legitimate mistake on my part. I actually overrode my own files with the folder I had FTP up there. Other than that one mistake, I've never, ever had a complication with updating the WordPress core, um, at, at, not once. So, and there's ways to get around it. There's ways to be free of fear. For example, WP Engine creates a, um, like a stupid, simple staging environment where you click one button, it duplicates everything over a staging environment, 
you go into the staging environment, you update the core, you look at your website, you see if anything is broken, and it's not, then you go back to your live environment, you update the core. And that's it. It's so simple. And there's really no excuse at this point. And the problem is, is that if we don't update, and people are left in the, in the lurches, right? You're left in the 2.x days or the early 3-point days. You create vulnerabilities for the entire community. It's the same exact issue with IE, right? Like, all of us have designed and developed websites or worked as a marketer or whatever, and how many times did we say to God, why don't these people update to IE6 or IE7 or IE8 or IE9 or IE10? and yet you're probably still running some WordPress installation with 2.7. It's the same exact thing. So just make sure you update core. It's absolutely vital. All right, so kind of covered most of this, but your main protections, keep, up, keep core up to date, keep plugins and themes up to date. The reason for themes and updates is absolutely vital because if somebody does notice a security flaw in a plugin or theme, most likely that plugin developer will be notified in some way, but the community may not be notified. And the reason for that is, let's say that WordPress SEO, just complete, um, uh, you know, for sake of argument real quick, with millions of downloads, has a major security flaw. If that is suddenly known to the entire public, then that's a security flaw that everybody can, you know, uh, harness, right, and take advantage of. So what they do is they'll update it first. They'll find the security flaw, they'll patch it, they'll fix it, they'll update it, present it to everybody as an update, then make it public to everybody once that security flaw has been fixed. So make sure you're updating your plugins. Uh, only use plugins you trust. Also, uh, if you're not using any plugins, if you have any plugins deactivated or themes deactivated, make sure you remove them completely. Just because the code isn't running every single time your page loads doesn't mean that those vulnerabilities don't exist. So for example, the Tim Thumb thing that came up a few years ago. Um, if you still had a theme or a plugin that had that code still there, uh, you could find it, you could still take advantage of it. So if you're not using it, there's no reason to keep it. All the plugins are free. You could even keep the code locally if you wanted to, but just remove it. Um, don't give people more access than they need. This is so simple, but people don't realize it. I get this all the time. I, I can't tell you how many times after a meetup like this or going into uh, uh, you know, the, the help section of this meetup, um, somebody will ask me for help, and they'll just give me admin access. And you guys know me from speaking at these conferences, from co-organizing and everything else, but I can't tell you how many times that somebody just hands me administrative access to their website. It drives me nuts, and I don't even want it. And it's more responsibility than I need. If you're asking me to co-author a post with you, why would you make me anything more than an author? I don't need it. I can upload images, I can write all the content I need, I can tag and categorize. The only thing I can't do is publish content. But if I'm writing on your blog, I shouldn't be publishing content unless that's the configuration or the workflow of your, 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 your site. And if that is, make me an editor. Give me free reign to publish on your website. But I don't need admin access to write. I don't need to go to your site uh, options and change the URL. I don't need to be able to in, uh, install my own plugin that gives me a backdoor to your website anytime I want to. So just make sure that you're only giving people the responsibility or the access that they actually need. If somebody um, doesn't need access anymore, don't think of it as insulting to remove them from the website, okay? It's not like Facebook friends where you're like unfriending them because they're not gonna write for you for three months. And if they are and you're gonna come back to you, just change their email address and change their password. And then give them access again later. And if somebody loses their password, don't reset the password and send it to them. There's a forgot password right there for them. They can go through the process of reset. Uh, re recreating their password all on their own. Don't send passwords through email. The problem with email is that if, if you had one bad password for email, I feel like one of the major security flaws for WordPress or any website is your email account. 
Because if I can get into your Gmail account, think about all the things I could do. I could reset probably the majority of your website's passwords. I could probably reset your bank password. I could reset a whole bunch of things. But don't, number one, make sure you, your Gmail password or any kind of email password is super secure. But also don't send emails with the password in it because if I hijack that, then I have free access to it. So when I gave a security-like talk years ago, I would say, uh, change the table prefix, but you had to do it manually. And you had to go into the wp-config file, you had to find the prefix define setting, you had to go in there and actually change some code, and it's a pain in the butt. Now when you do an installation, they just give you this, right there. Change your table prefix. The reason that you change your table prefix is because one of the best things you can do to prevent security flaws is to not be predictable, right? One of the reasons that people think that WordPress websites are so insecure is because all they hear about are how people hack a WordPress website. But is that because WordPress is insecure? Or is that because WordPress powers 21% of the entire internet? And that there are literally millions of people who have administrative access to websites and their password is password. It's very likely. I mean, if you look at the Adobe password release, I think the top 100 passwords are crackable in an instant. Like, like that, boom. And there are like things like password, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Um, there are some really horribly disgusting ones up there too. Um, it's a fun read if you go through it. Some of us joked about uh, hiring Morgan Freeman to just read the password list in his voice. I think there would be like, a million views on YouTube in four seconds. But um, it, it's very likely, right? So WordPress, because it's so ubiquitous and so easy to install, it's very likely, um, or you know, here's a good example. Remember uh, early 2000s, Apple's big thing was that they're uninfectable. Right? Buy an Apple computer and you can't get a virus. It's impossible. It's not even possible to get a virus on an Apple computer. That's not true. What was true was that they had like 1% of market share. So there was no reason for anybody to create a virus for an Apple computer. Because if they created one for Microsoft, they'd have 99% of the market share. It's kind of the same thing with WordPress. I mean, if I'm looking to create a botnet Right? like a network of computers, or if I'm trying to make tens of thousands of dollars on Viagra ads, does it make sense for me to learn Joomla or Drupal who has, I think it's like less than 2% of the entire market? It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense at all to do that. It makes sense for me to learn the patterns and understand what's going on with WordPress so I can understand how to get into it and find those elements and take advantage of it. Doesn't mean that WordPress is less secure, it just means that people understand it better. So, in the effort of being unpredictable, make sure you change your table prefixes. Because all the tables that WordPress uses in its database, if you don't change that, they're all WP underscore options, WP underscore posts, WP underscore users, WP underscore whatever. So, if I wanted to do a SQL injection, I don't even have to guess that where your tables are. I just know. All you have to do is change the two characters, and you save yourself from that. Yep. Yeah, you sure can. So the question was, is this is on installation. How do you do this if you have a WordPress installation already going? And um, there are plugins out there that do it, although I have never used them. Um, there's three things you have to do to, ch or two things you have to, no, three things you have to do to change a table prefix on a live site. One is go to the WP config file, and there's an actual defined variable called table prefix. Change that to whatever you change it. Go to your database, change the tables. So you'll see WP underscore post, WP underscore whatever. Change that to your new table prefix name. So it would be, like in my case, it might be like JF23 underscore post, whatever it might be. There's one other little wonky thing that happens all the time. And uh, in my heyday when I was doing migrations, 
I lost a lot of hair by literally ripping it out because when you migrate a site, for me anyways, when I migrate a site, I'd be like, oh wow, they're using WP underscore, I need to change their table prefix while I'm at it. There's a setting in WP options for user roles that's based on the same exact table name, uh, table prefix that you have. So if your table prefix is JF23, that setting is WP underscore roles, needs to be JF23 underscore roles. If you don't change that one setting in the options table, you lock yourself out of your installation. It doesn't take your site down, but you can no longer log in. And it's, a, it's one of those things that, it's not necessarily a flaw, it's just one of those things that's just not documented well, so people don't know about it, and it drives people nuts. So those three things, yeah. Uh, since it's critical to change uh, the prefix, how so that the core team didn't like implement a random prefix at installation? Well, I think that yeah, that's yeah. A, another good question. So the question was, is why does not core require to just create like a random prefix? There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one, if I'm a developer and I know exactly what I'm doing, I might rely on my table prefix for a certain thing. The other thing is, is that core doesn't necessarily take the responsibility for your security, and nor should it. There's the same exact reason why it doesn't require you to have a password of strength strong. It gives you the meter and it tells you that it, uh, whether it's weak or strong, but it doesn't force you to be strong. And uh, in one of my classes, I had a great debate with my students, and I asked them, what, you know, what do they think about it? And we split up into two groups, and they made some fantastic arguments. But what I came down to is, is that I think if WordPress takes responsibility for your security, they have to take responsibility for every facet of your security, even de-hacking you or anything else. And it's not that hard. I mean, they make it so easy to change the prefix. They make it so easy to create strong passwords. And they can't even get people to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the problem with, that, that's a good point. So the problem with passwords, and this is a great philosophical debate for us in 2014 in the digital age, when we need access to our elements, right? Like we need access to our bank, we need access to our website, we need access to whatever it may be, Instagram or Snapchat. Um, uh, passwords are inherently dangerous, right? The problem with passwords is that our brain can only remember and compute so many characters and remember so many versions of those for so many different websites, right? So a MIT graduate down the street who specializes in cryptography might tell you that you should have a unbelievably strong password, at least 13 characters long, completely random, has absolutely no memorable elements to it in any way, no patterns, no nothing, and you need one of those for every single thing that you access across the internet. Sounds ideal, but it's not physically possible for our human brains to remember that. So it creates this problem where hackers and attackers are able to use computers to hack your websites, whereas you have to use your brain to enter into your own website. And it's not able to reach that computing element. So the theory is, is that you create a reasonably easy password or you create a ridiculously hard password. If you use the former, you use something like two-factor authentication. And I'll talk about that in a second. If you use the latter, use something like one password or last password or something like that to help you uh, enter into those websites. The challenges with that, though, is, is that you need to be on your device. You need to have those things. So if you find yourself in a situation where you need to access your email on your mom's computer because your laptop died or something like that, um, there's a lot of challenges with that. So. Um, passwords are the number one vulnerability across the board with anything. It doesn't matter if you're um, a think tank for the government or whatever. If your website has a billion dollar security budget or it's a knitting flaw on WordPress, if your admin has a very easy password, that is the vulnerability and that's the only thing that people need.
Um, and we talk about patterns. The other thing is your admin username. So there's two theories behind changing your username. One is, is that usernames are public. Your username right now for all of your WordPress installations are completely public. People don't realize this, but it's true. I can go in and I can determine based off of your, uh, I can just keep going through a whole bunch of stuff. I, maybe I shouldn't release that information, but I can figure out what your username is. People get scared of this, but then they don't remember. If I'm gonna hack your Twitter account, isn't your username public? I want to hack your Gmail account. Isn't your username public? It's, it's across the board. Your usernames are public. And that shouldn't be a fearful element. But at the same time, you shouldn't find a pattern. right? You shouldn't be a part of the millions of people who are vulnerable. So when you create a new WordPress installation, make sure you change that admin username. Not necessarily because it's not public, but because you won't fall victim to the botnets or the computer scripts out there that are just paying admin as a username. So sometimes a hacker or an attacker will play the odds and just assume that of the 100,000 WordPress websites they're gonna try and attack today, maybe 10% of them or 20% of them have a username of admin. Does that make sense? It doesn't necessarily make you more secure to a direct attack, but it makes you more secure from a generalized attack. So remember, stay unpredictable. Don't let that, don't fall victim to that kind of stuff. Um, all right. So I kind of touched this, on this a few times, but definitely protect yourself from botnet attacks or brute force attacks. This is the number one way someone's going to get into your website. If you've done your due diligence, if you've secured your website, if you've hardened your, your website, um, you're not using any plugins or themes with vulnerabilities, uh, WordPress core is up to date. The only way I'm probably gonna get into your website is by guessing your password. And the only way I'm gonna guess your password is by using a brute force attack. And what a brute force attack is, basically means, is that I'm just gonna keep hitting your server, and keep guessing at your password until I'm successful. So there's a few plugins out there that protect you from these types of attacks. Brute Protect is a fantastic plugin, but I'm biased. Um, but it, what it does is a little bit different than everybody else is that it uses the network itself to protect you. So, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand real quick. All right, just raise it high. All right, so if, this, if I try to hack this gentleman's website today at uh, 7.55, and I try to do that three times in the next 10 minutes, limit log, all these other plugins would be successful in blocking. Okay, because I'm one IP address. But if I try to hack your website, and your website, and your website, those would not be able to protect you. Group Protect would be able to. The other thing that's a little bit different is that all I would have to do is have a failed attempt on your website, your website, your website, one time, and Group Protect is able to determine that this is an IP address that's trying to get into multiple websites in a short period of time and they don't know their own username or password, so they must be a botnet. And because of that, we're able to protect from a far more, a uh, larger number of botnets and a shorter number of uh, attempts, which results in a great deal less stress on your server. So one of the attacks you have to be aware of is that even if I'm not getting access to your site, I can still take you down. A DDoS attack that meetup.com we all use and love, was uh, vulnerable to in March, was that uh, attackers basically slammed their servers, kept making requests over and over and over again um, for a period of, maybe, I think it was like 27 hours, their site was down. And it was because the server couldn't keep up with those requests. So unlike Limit Login, for example, which I, I love the plugin because the developer did such a great job with it when it was, um, when it was needed, but it hasn't been it hasn't had an update. I think in like 16 months or something like that. Um, and all it does is basically says this one IP. I'm going to check against it three times in every hour. But if I'm a botnet, I'll hit you 50 times in an hour with 50 different IP addresses, and that becomes completely useless. So a DDoS attack, I can still hit you the 50 times, 
and that's um, like 700 database requests. So every single time that you visit the login page of your WordPress installation, it's 12 database requests. So I could just keep hitting you and hitting you and hitting you and hitting you until eventually your server's like, I can't handle this anymore, I'm out. With Brew Protect, what it does is it actually prevents you from actually accessing the website and just free <coughs> database requests. So it reduces the server load by 75%. Um, WordFence, WordFence says that they do similar things. We haven't actually been able to figure it out. We've kind of tried to communicate with them. Haven't heard much back. But it's gotten a lot of downloads and we've heard a lot of great things. So if you don't want to use Google Tech, definitely install WordPress because you need something to protect yourself from botnets. The other um, plugin, Better WP Security, which I should rename to iTheme Security, um, Sometime in early March, Chris Wiegman sold it to iThemes, and now it's called iThemes Security. It's probably one of the most well-known security plugins out there. The way in which it protects from botnets is that you create a list of blacklisted IP addresses, which is a very manual process. Still works amazingly well, and I suggest that you guys install um, iThemes Security today. If you haven't already, definitely install it because it's one of those plugins that hardens your security. It gives you alerts on every single thing that you need to do. Make sure that you're secure across the board. and gives you a ton of features to harden your WordPress installation. You can also do everything we're talking about through the HD access file. And if you know how to use an HD access file, you probably already know how to block IP addresses. Yeah. Um, yes, but I, so the question is: there is, is there a delay? Um, sort of, I guess yes, but it's so minimal. Um, I mean, we see in the single-digit milliseconds that it, I mean, so technically yes, there is a delay, but it's so minuscule that it doesn't actually produce any kind of bad results. Yeah. Is there a service that also assesses? So iThemes or WP Security will not necessarily give you a numeric score, but it will give you a uh, clear picture of your security vulnerabilities. So I would definitely install that. iThemes Security or Better, P, uh, Better WP Security and Root Protect or iThemes Security and a, another botnet solution complement each other very well. So iThemes Security's number one goal is not protecting you from botnets, it's about hardening your security overall. Yeah. Do you recommend installing all of these plugins, or do they overlap? Um, the top three overlap. So I would say, across the board, install iTunes Security, or um, there's another one out there. I forget the name of it. It's like, <coughs> yeah, I forget it. There's two types of security plugins. There's basically one that's going to harden your WordPress installation. And what that's going to do is basically look for vulnerabilities, look for areas where you can improve, and change those things and make it better. The thing is with that is that almost all of them change your HD access file for you and um, either block access to the admin during certain periods of time or whatever it may be. The problem with installing two plugins that talk to your HD access file and modify your HD access file is that you have two plugins modifying your HD access file probably doing the same thing. So don't do that. Choose the one that's best for you. Again, I recommend iTunes Security. The other type of plugin that you need to do is like a shield. It's like a protection layer. It stops people from accessing your server from blacklisted IP addresses. Those, you don't need multiple versions of those because they'll just interact with each other poorly. But the two types of plugins, one that hardens security and one blocking IP addresses, complement each other very well. So, Completely biased answer. Number one and number four. Yeah. If you use a plugin that modifies your HTML file, once it's made that modification, can you deactivate the plugin? Sure, but I would recommend it. If you make the effort to trust that plugin and allow them access to change your HD access file, you shouldn't necessarily revoke that trust. And if something new comes out, you want to be able to update that plugin and 
have access to this new thing. Um, so I'm going to stop plugging for tech, but we've had 75,000 sites protected, 68 million blocked attacks, and it's been alive for less than a year. So the more websites that we have, the faster we can protect everything. All right, so backup plans are probably like the, the most important thing that I haven't discussed yet. Because it doesn't matter, all those things that you've done, if you piss off like anonymous or something, they'll find a way into your website. Somebody will hijack something and do something and get access to it and get in there. So make sure that you have a backup. And don't necessarily rely on your hosting provider. A lot of people think that these hosting providers, because they provide backups, will have a backup. They might go back once every month. And if you're a shopping cart website or you're a blogger that blogs three times a day, it's a lot of information to lose. There's a lot of great backup solutions. Backup Buddy, uh, WordPress backup to Dropbox is fantastic because it actually sends it to Dropbox. Um, backup WP and Vault Press, which is a paid for option, but it's made by Automatic. So everybody in the back over there on the stairs, the cool kids in the back, they probably talk about it. Um, the goal with backup is one, have a good backup, and two, have it off-site. So do not have it on your server. Because if what happens is somebody hacks the entire server and they delete everything, or they take down a box, or maybe just a tsunami comes and wipes out Dallas. I'm sorry for you Texans out there, but I mean, and something could happen, right? Like, something's possible. Just make sure that you have it off-site so that you can back everything up. Can I add a number three? Yeah. Um, test your backup when you set it up so you know it's actually backing up. Yes, and, and don't actually just think that because a zip file is in existence, it's backed up. Make sure you open it, make sure you test it, just install it locally or something like that. Just make sure everything's there and do that periodically because I've known plugins or solutions or something that run into an error and maybe you don't get that notification one day and then you know the worst thing in the world happens. All right. I think this is one of the last slides and then we'll wrap up. Connect carefully. I talked about um, on Wi-Fi, be very careful. If you uh, have the ability to, connect over SSL for your admin and then you have a secure connection. Um, if you don't, uh, use Cloak or some similar device. It's an app that you can install like right in your browser and it'll create a secure, a ton of those through a secure connection right to any website you need. Uh, Brute Protect Pro will be offering secure logins. Don't use FTP, we talked about that, use SFTP. Don't send passwords through email. If you need to send a password to someone, use something like Quick Forget. Quick Forget is a cool little app. What it does is it, it, allow, it saves whatever information you save, and it lets you limit the number of views and date and time frame. So if I'm sending you a password, and uh, I know that you need it today, I can say after 24 hours expiring, and it'll never be accessible again. And it gives you a quick URL, and you can throw it into an email. And the chances of someone hacking your email within that 24 hour period is greatly reduced, and you have a much more secure solution. Um, don't forget, have extremely strong passwords, or use 1Password or something like that um, to help you with that solution. Also, two factor authentication. Do you guys understand what two-factor authentication is? Yeah, like one, not again. So two-factor authentication basically means that it requires you to have two elements to log in. How many people are uh, fans of um, House of Cards? Okay, so remember in House of Cards when the hacker wanted to get into the Washington Journal or whatever, the Washington Post, and the guy typed in his password, and then on his computer, on his uh, phone, he got a text message with a code. So that requires two forms of authentication. One is his knowledge factor, which is that he knows his password. The second is a possession factor. He has a phone, it's his personal phone, and that text message comes to him and only him, and that's the two factor. There are other ways to do two factor. Uh, one of my favorite plugins is called Clef. And uh, if you haven't used Clef, it's absolutely out of this world amazing. I'll do a quick demo for you if you guys are interested. But basically allows you to use your phone to log in, no passwords at all, and uh, uses like a, like a waiting barcode. 
and it relies on the pin that I type into my phone and the possession of my phone for two-factor authentication, and nobody can gain access. Gmail offers two-factor two authentication. You can turn it on. I would do that right away. Basically, if you're using a device that you are not secured, like your personal laptop, anytime you log into Gmail, it'll send you a text message, you take the six-digit pin, you type it back into Gmail, and it gives you access. Two-factor authentication is the gold standard, and it is the absolute best way to secure yourself, not just for WordPress, but anything across the board. Also, when you're creating passwords on WordPress, um, it uses the Zixabin library, which tells you how strong things are, and it's absolutely 100% um, accurate. But one, one thing people don't realize is that you can use passphrases. So if you say something like, um, there's no place like home with spaces, um, it takes centuries to crack that, because the entropy on a space, on a, a space character, is so high that you can just create a passphrase. Most banks and other websites don't allow you to create passphrases, but if you just say that, all lowercase um, and with spaces, uh, nobody will ever hack your site. So, try that. The other one you Clef, C L E F. Yeah. Yep. Um, we have time for questions, and I can do a demo. Yeah. So something like that, uh, so the, what you said was um, pass raises are crackable because there are uh, computer systems out there that use English language and sentences and common phrases and things like that. So something like there's no place like home from Wizard of Oz is probably not a good example. But if you say like horse, fax machine, awesome, WordPress, something like that, um, you're still gaining that access, that, that uh, strength. The other thing is, is that if you play the numbers game, um, most botnets or, or hacking systems don't have that technology just yet. And the goal at any time is just to stay one step ahead of them. Uh, just one other thing you mentioned too, is that when you use something like one password, uh, you often use one password on multiple devices, yep. and it's safe. Yep. One way it does that is to Dropbox, so make sure that your Dropbox is right. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's so many things out there that require this central hub to work, whether it's Dropbox or your email account or whatever it might be. Make sure that your email password or your Dropbox account or whatever it may be is super secure, ultra secure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And that works if you are. Could you repeat that? Uh, so, what this gentleman said was is that you could blacklist everything except for the one or two or three IP addresses that you know that you're connecting from on a secure network. So if you're uh, logging from home, you would grab your IP address, whitelist that, which means that anybody can access your website from within that network, and then block everybody else. And that might work for some people, and I know that works in a corporate environment for some people where you're only able to access a website from within that corporate environment. But for me personally, that would be hell. Like today, I've worked on an Amtrak train, I've worked at Meat Hall, I've worked here. That's true, and you can beat me up. Yeah. So it all depends. Yep. Bulletproof security was the one I was trying to think of that's uh, similar to uh, iTunes security. So that's a, um, a hardening, that's hardening, security hardening. Yeah, so the majority of what I talked about today is best practice for the internet in general. Having strong passwords, don't connect over FTP, don't connect over Wi-Fi, things like that. I am sure there are solutions for botnet protection and things like that for Joomla and Drupal. Brew Protect, uh, we're working on that solution for ourselves right now um, because we, again, our goal is to provide a safer environment for everybody. Um, 
But again, uh, I don't work in jewelry people, so I don't have those answers. But you know, if you take most of the stuff you learned today, it's it's uh, universal. It's across the board. Does anybody have any good solutions for jewelry and jewel websites? Are mean their their security? They're like Apple in the early 2000s. You just don't even have to worry about it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just can't hear you. Okay, I said that the statistics of users in Drupal are not that much of it. Yeah, I mean, you can pull up the number. You can just type into uh, Google W3 CMS market share. Right, so um, um, one press is of vulnerable attacks. WordPress is what? Vulnerable to attacks compared to Drupal due to statistics. You think it's more vulnerable to attacks? Because the more users are on WordPress, Right, and that was the that was the statement I made earlier. Because right. of the fact that there are literally millions and millions of users, it's more likely that someone's got crap more crappy passwords out there. Just like how in India there are more people who are geniuses than there are people in the United States, just because of the sheer population over there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think that the more, the stronger your website, right? So the more popular website grows, the more likely you're going to see a direct attack. So if you ask that same question to people who run TechCrunch, which is a WordPress website, or NBC Sports, or uh, CBS Radio, which are all WordPress websites, I can guarantee you they've seen direct attacks. Yeah. Yeah. question was whether I have an opinion about the ping back feature. Um, the user experience person inside of me says how much I hate it. It's completely useless in my opinion. Um, I mean, if I'm reading your article, I don't really care at that moment who else has linked to your article. So it's not useful to me as a person. Um, but as the marketer in me, I guess that makes a lot of sense to have tracking links and to be aware of what's going on and things like that. And from a security standpoint, and your concern is, is that you're just making yourself more uh, available and, and creating oh, sure. a connection I mean, of uh, WordPress websites. It doesn't, it doesn't affect your site, but there was the, the little denial of service attack that said right. how spoofed the pain backs and added everybody's WordPress. Yeah, I think that at the, at the end of the day, though, there's there's a million ways to, to make that connection. Sure. Um, I just don't like pain backs personally. Yeah. I mean, that's what my opinion. Is that it? You guys want to see a demo of Clap for a quick? Yeah? All right. Does everybody have their uh, prevent my head from blowing out of the back of my skull helmet on? All right. So I'm going to log into my WordPress installation. Now I can have my password completely turned off if I want to. So you wouldn't even see a password. You'd see that little button right there that says log in with my phone. I pull up Clef, the app, which is available on iPhone and Android devices. I type in my PIN, and I get this waving bar. I click here, I get the waving bar. So I don't think I can do it on the projector, but basically I just use the, it has to have a forward facing camera. And I just hold up the bar. There's no way it's gonna work way up there. But if I just hold it up to the screen, you'll see the, uh, the barcodes will sync. And I'm in, just like that. So CLEF, C-L-E-F. If you install CLEF or Group Protect, they both um, recommend each other. 
so you can just install one. Um, and just for people, like I have a website that gets like maybe a couple hundred visitors a month. You can see that I've had 314 malicious attempts on my website since like January. Um, so you can see that it's, it's pretty common for everybody to get. Uh, so someone was asking about Drupal earlier, Clef is available. Yeah, that's true too. Yep. Cool thing about Clef is that now I'm logged in for 59 minutes. If I am doing this on a public machine, like a library or something like that, or my school or something like that, um, I can click log out now. And if I refresh, I am now logged out. Yeah, is your password in your keychain? Make the kid log in there. I could, yeah. So the goal, so I leave this up for demos because I tend to demo this pretty often. But the goal with Clef would be that you remove the access to the password altogether. So you wouldn't even be able to type in a password. You have to have your phone. So you can't override it. <laughs> right, so the only way, if I had that turned on so my password was eliminated completely, the only way you could log into my website would be to beat me up, which would be tough for most of you, steal my phone, have my fingerprint on my phone to access it, know my four-digit pin to Clef, and then also hold it up to a computer. So you'd have to do all of that stuff, and I think the hardest part of that would probably be beating me up or stealing it. That's it. That's all I got.